السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله My brothers and sisters, especially the young people, we've started a very short series just to educate the young people about relationships and marriage in Islam. Last week I spoke a little bit about how to uh, introduce yourself to someone and the types of questions and topics that you should be talking about when you meet someone and the best ways of meeting them, what's allowed and what's not allowed. I also spoke about the five situations of marriage. Sometimes it's compulsory, other times it's desirable, recommended. There are times where it's just neutral, neither this way or that way. There is a third, uh, fourth situation when it's disliked, and there is also a situation when marriage is forbidden. I spoke about this last week, inshallah, we will, we will release it on, on YouTube and the uh, social media, inshallah ta'ala. But just to let you know that marriage, there's no one blanket rule about it. You can't say it's compulsory and you can't say it's haram. It does depend on the situation and each case. So Islam is a very practical religion that really goes in line with the nature of human beings, brothers and sisters. It's not outside of this world. And inshallah today, I'm going to talk more about it and just talk about... I want to talk about three things today, inshallah. Hmm, this one. So, inshallah, I want to talk about three things today. And then we'll open it up for any questions that you might have. The three things I want to talk about, because we have young people here, I'm going to start with what does having a crush mean? And what does Islam say about it? What is the alternative? Number two, I'm going to talk about how does istikhara play a role in finding a spouse in marriage because this is a, a lot of people ask me this question and then number three I'm going to talk about the technicalities the fiqh which is the uh, jurisprudence how is an Islamic marriage done what are its conditions how is it done what do all of its conditions mean how do you know them and agree on them so I think everybody needs to know these three lessons today, insha'Allah. And I hopefully, Ya Rab, I will give you examples of real life. And I'm going to address the questions that apply to especially us Muslims who live in Western majority countries or European countries. Uh, so insha'Allah ta'ala, let's begin. First of all, this will be a quick one, insha'Allah. I get young children as young as 11, 12 years old, 13 years old, even my little daughter who is in grade 4, and her friends ask me these questions. Because of social media, they hear these statements all the time. And unfortunately, the media now is flooded with topics on sexuality from a very, very young age. So I get these questions asked, and I'm sure you as parents will as well. She says, or they say to me, what is a crush? I have a crush on so-and-so. Kids as young as grade one say, I have a crush on so-and-so. And today I even got asked by some young uh, girls at the school, very, quite young, maybe 10, 11, 12 years old, what is a crush? Is it halal to have a crush? So let's first of all understand what is a crush in the English language in the Western society? What does it mean? So if you look up the dictionary, anything, the Oxford or the Merriam-Webster, or you look up the Cambridge or the uh, any any kind of uh, English dictionary, and you'll find a similar meaning, which means a crush is a strong and intense feeling, which makes you think that you like someone, but it is temporary, and usually you like someone who you know is highly unlikely you will ever be with. This thing called a crush can take you into seriously dangerous areas from an Islamic perspective and from an emotional mental perspective. People with crushes can get obsessed with their crush. It can sometimes be a celebrity, religious or non-religious. It can be someone at school because they got interested in what they see on social media, let's say a particular hairstyle or a particular look, and they go to school and they see that boy or that girl who looks like that person they saw on social media, and they find that oh, he or she is my crush. Sometimes they have some interests that they find that maybe they have the same as them, and then they say, I've got a crush. 
This thing can be obsessive, and a person can turn into a stalker. They can follow that person, look at their social media page. They can, um, every time they're around, they act different, they act weird. Some of them, they, if they come on a tram or by transport, they'll probably go and deliberately wait outside the school, probably unsupervised, and then wait for the particular tram, particular transportation where they know that crush is going to be on, or they'll wait out school and wag, or they'll do a lot of things that really makes them misbehave just for their crush. Uh, it can lead you to obsession. They can stop eating, they can stop drinking, they can stop sleeping if they get too much and follow this desire of a crush. So, brothers and sisters, it is a dangerous thing. Crush means it would truly will crush you if you follow that desire. However, brothers and sisters, please understand me. Having a crush is just another name of this natural feeling that, especially young people, the younger you are, the more you'll have this. The older you are, the less likely, because you understand life and you have more experience in understanding people, emotions and relationships, and you focus on what really matters. You start to understand life better. But when you're younger, you have a fantasy, you have this imagination that goes through your head. And it makes you feel good. When you have a crush, it gives you those special tingly they call it butterfly feelings in your stomach. Okay, I'm even sure that some older people have felt that when they got engaged and they had some interest. It's very normal. So these girls asked me, boys don't usually talk about it, but they even have crushes, they just don't know what to call it. Girls are very smart with wording, so they know what they're saying and they, mashallah, they ask these questions. So having a crush is sometimes out of your control. It's just a feeling that comes to you. The community, your friends talk to you, what you see on social media affects you. And so you feel, oh, I like that boy, I like that girl. So that feeling, if it's out of your control and it just came to you, it's not a sin, it's not haram, but acting on it becomes haram, acting on it. So if you follow that feeling of crush, because it's kind of a romantic thing, right? I like that boy, I like that girl, romantically. And they think it's called love, but it's not love, right? And especially if they're very young, they're not ready for marriage, they don't know what marriage is. They don't know what relationships are. So they're exploring. Uh, we've got to educate them for parents to sit with their daughters and their sons to tell them what is a crush, define it to them, tell them why it's not good to follow in that feeling in Islam because it's going to make you, it's going to break your heart, it's going to hurt your feelings, it's not real, it's a fantasy, right? It's just something that doesn't really exist. And what happens is that it lasts for about a few weeks to two months, some people even to four months. These girls said, how long does it last? I said six months, just in case. And inshallah, it does, it does go away. So these are, if you do feel something like that, brothers and sisters, I always advise my brothers and sisters this. Are you ready for marriage? Can you get married? Can you go and start the process and you know, meet the family and ask for her hand and it doesn't have to be marriage straight away, but can you get engaged? Are you ready to meet people to get married? Are you old enough? Are you mature enough? If all the, the answers are no, then know that all you're doing is that you're torturing yourself if you follow the feelings of liking or having a crush. Okay? It'll go away and you will move on. But don't act on it, because it can lead you to bad places. I have had these experiences with young people, past and present. I've been teaching for about, what, 16, 17 years. And I do a bit of counseling, student counseling. So these students do come to me, Muslims. And you always have this story, all the time, brothers and sisters. And I think parents should really start to learn about these terminologies and talk to their children about, and I dare to say it, the word sexuality, love, liking, relationships from a young age. Talk to them about puberty from the age of 9 or 10, even 8, for the girls especially because they reach puberty before boys. Talk about these topics and let it be a normal topic that you as parents can talk with your children. Children, talk with your parents. Talk about your experiences. How did you meet their mum? How did you meet their dad? But, you know, within reason. Let them talk to you rather than talking to someone else. I know a brother who I learned this from. He says, I say to my daughter all the time, she is an angel. I even joke with her with uh, cheap lines like, did it hurt when you fell from heaven because you're an angel? These cheap pickup lines. He says them to his daughter. His daughter says, come on, dad, that's, you know, you don't say stuff like that. But she became normalized to it so that he said to me, because I know some other boys are going to come and use cheap lines to pick her up. So I'm going to beat them to it. And whenever they say it, she says, oh, my dad says those to me. My brother says that to me. 
So, brothers and sisters, get that used to it so that she doesn't, she doesn't fall for the praise who just want to prey on her. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, brothers and sisters. So, I'm going to move on from the word, from this thing called uh, crush. And, by the way, love, love really comes after you've met somebody and you've lived together for a while. Uh, marriage doesn't necessarily have to have intense love from the beginning. Marriage can build the love or can crush the love later on. It depends on how you build it how you are there for each other. As a man said to Umar ibn al-Khattab, I like this person, I trust him. He says, did you travel with him? Did you uh, stay at his house? Have you done any business trade with him? He said, no. He said, then you don't know him. Don't say you just like him. You just like what you see or what you can imagine he is. So really in marriage, you get to know each other more and you just learn about the important things that you need to know for a marriage. And understand that when you marry someone, you're bringing two families together. You're, sometimes you're bringing tribes together. Tribes. Some people, Lebanese, Turkish, Somalian, marrying Asian, whatever. Islam allows all these types of marriages and makes no distinction so long as you are compatible and you're good for each other. We bring countries together through marriage. It's not just you and him or you and her. It's not Hollywood where you both hold hands and walk out into the sunset as if the whole world doesn't exist. You have families together. So talk to older people. Talk to wise people. Talk to your parents. There's nothing wrong with saying to mum, what's a crush? I have a crush on this boy. Let her talk to you. Let dad talk to you. It's all right. Talk to older people so they can guide you, and not just your little friends who are around you. Because in Arabic, the friend that you have at school, or the friend that you have who's your same age, the only thing they can really do for you is just to lean on them, to hug them and cry, or just to talk and they say, oh, I'm here. But really they can't do much. They can't advise you more than what you know. A 13-year-old girl getting advice from another 13-year-old girl, what's she going to know? She only knows what she knows. But getting advice from a mother or an aunt who was older or some, or a teacher or anybody else who was older, like an older sister who can advise you or a brother or a father, these people can advise you and can guide you in a better way. So always good to have a friend or a family member who's older than you, you can take advice from. Uh, a friend who is at school, who is your age, is called Rafiq. In Arabic, Rafiq means the elbow. Mirfaq. Comes from Mirfaq, because Arabic is so particular with names. And there are eight different types of friends mentioned in the Quran. One of them is Rafiq. And Rafiq is an elbow, which means you can only lean on them. Just share your emotions with them, and that's about it. But they can't really solve much for you. Okay, so you need a wali. A wali means someone older who is responsible for you, who's invested in you, like your father, your uncle, your brother. Uh, if you have a son, for example, your mother, all these who are invested in you, that what happens to you will affect them. These people can guide you better. Anyway, brothers and sisters, let's move on to the second part of this talk. We've talked about the crush. Now let's talk about the istikhara. This is for some older people. I always get asked the question, even today I got it. This is probably the most that I get questions about relationships and family. Married couples, divorced couples, people who are having problems, people who are ready to get married. Today we're going to talk about those who want to get married. And once you want to get married, obviously it is a little bit scary when you think about lifelong relationship. Because the person you choose, they're with you. They're stuck with you, and you're stuck with them. You're going to have to make it work. That choice is it. And it will affect every part of your life. That is true. However, there is, alhamdulillah, a beauty to it. If you follow the right pathways, inshallah, and the best, path, best pathway is to follow the pathway of Allah, God, who made you. We have, alhamdulillah, the Qur'an ready for us, and we have the statements of our prophets and our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so intricately and detailed right to even what he used to do with his wife inside the house. She used to describe how he was as a husband. So we have so much detail. We have even how many white hairs the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had in his beard. Literally, we counted them. And we know everything about it. So we have so much information and guidance as a basis to which way to go about it. So let's talk about the istikhara. A lot of people say, I made an istikhara. Should I, do I have to have a feeling? Am I meant to see a dream? Is there a sign? Just today someone asked me. I, she said, I, I, I got interested in a brother, a family member. And 
After a long time, and I made istikhara, I asked him, or I sent someone to ask him, and he said, no, I'm not interested. She said, is that a sign? I said, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, he doesn't want you. There's no, there's no you know, magical thing about it. So my brothers and sisters, someone else, they approached me and said, and this is a cultural tradition, I'm going to talk about some really wrong things that people do. Sometimes culture, sometimes it's our elders who get it wrong and, and stuff it up for the young people. They make it very hard for them. One of the things about istikhara that is so false and wrong is when the, they say you have to get um, your father or your grandfather or a sheikh or an imam to do the istikhara for you because they're more holy, they're more religious. So they'll do the istikhara for you and then they'll tell you what dream they had. And the dream will tell them if you should go ahead or not. This is the most misleading thing I've ever heard in my life. It contradicts all the teachings of Islam. There is nothing in the Qur'an or Sunnah of the entire hadith. You search it and I challenge anyone to find it. A text where the Qur'an or the Prophet ﷺ told us that's how the istikhara is done. Istikhara is a prayer. You pray two rak'ahs, then you ask Allah, dua and salat. You don't go in and say to somebody, hey, you know, I just came into the mosque. Can you please do the tahiyyat al-masjid for me? I'll just sit on the corner over there. You don't say that to people. Salat and dua is yours. The proper way to do it is that you have to do it because you're the one who's meaning it. It's coming out from your heart. You're the one who wants Allah to help you, right? No one else. So it's not from the sunnah, it's not from Islam that someone else does the istikhara for you. I don't know where people got this from. I don't know what justifications they had. I'm not saying it's haram. I'm just saying it's not the right way and you're going to be misled that way. I've had these situations. A lot of people come, so I'm not going to say one person, many. They come to me and say, well, my grandfather said he is going to do the istikhara for me. A brother asked for me, for example, or a sister asked for me. And you got the grandfather, for example, or the father or an uncle who has gone on a very different tangent of Islam. You know, a very spiritual one that's, you know, the type of spirituality where they're detached from what reality of life really is. You know, some people take Islam as something so spiritual that it's completely detached from real life. It's almost a fantasy. That's not how Islam is. Islam is practical. So the grandfather went, or the father, I don't know who, they made istikhara, they saw a dream, it was a bad dream. Maybe the shaitan came to them, I don't know. And they said, you're not allowed to marry this guy. But he's a good guy. He's a religious guy. He's a good, good character. He has a job. He has an income. He's known to be trustworthy. He's known to be honest. Everybody talks well about him. He's got a good reputation at school. He's got a good family. No, the dream. They base it on the dream. Brothers and sisters, there are so many stories like this. Sometimes they say, I made an istikhara and I really want this person. So, so why did you do the istikhara? The istikhara is asking Allah for advice and guiding you. Someone said, can I say the first part of the istikhara, not the second part? Because this is how the istikhara goes. Rasul, the Prophet wasallam, said, if any of you has decided to take a step towards a particular endeavor, anything in life. You have made the decision and you want to go ahead. Before you go ahead, pray two rak'ahs and say the istikhara. The istikhara sounds like this, Oh Allah, I seek your counsel for you know I do not know. You, um, you have the, the qadr, you are the one who wills, I cannot will. You are the all-knower of everything. Oh Allah, if this is good for me in my religion, my well-being and... and worldly affairs and my hereafter then grant it to me and grant me to it and bless it for us and if it is bad for me for my religion my worldly affairs and well-being and for my hereafter then keep it away from me and me away from it and guide me to where is better and make me accept it now someone said to me can I say the first part if it is good for me bring it and me to it but not the second part I said well that's not istikhara you're asking Allah to make it work for you some people go all the way to Umrah or Hajj, and in front of the Kaaba, I heard this. They stand before the Kaaba and said, Oh Allah, if she is good for me, bring her. If he is good for me, bring I know a lot of people like that. They ended up, uh, their marriage fell apart, by the way. Because we don't understand what it means to have signs and dreams. Now let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. There's nowhere where it says that the istikhara, the condition of istikhara is that you have to have an open heart. Uh, that you feel good all the way, or that you have to have a dream. There's nothing like that. Rasul said, once you have made your decision, now listen carefully, it says, 
إذا هم أحدكم إذا عزم أحدكم The hadith is in Bukhari If one of you has decided What does that mean? One of you has decided meaning You have gone, researched, investigated Asked about them, met them or Sorry, even before meeting them Let's say you want to make a stikhara to go and meet them for marriage You go and ask about them You find out if they even want to get married you research about them, you ask families, you ask friends, look at their social media page. After you've done all that research, then you make the istikhara before going over. Then after you meet them and talk to them and you investigate a second, the second step, after all that, you use, you use your logic, you use your rationale, you study, you investigate, you think about what you want, you ask the questions, you study the topics. Then before the next major step, making the decision to get married, Make an istikhara. Why? Because there's two parts to making a decision. Number one is the normal, practical, logical rationale of how things work. Get to know the person for crying out loud. Do all the proper stuff. Take advice from experts, from your parents. Do all that stuff. Know what you want. Ask the right questions. We talked about that last week. That's for the now. You want to get married now? Do your investigation for the now. So what is the istikhara for? The istikhara is for the later. The istikhara is for the future. We know what's happening now, but we're not, we don't know what, where it will go in the future. So we make the istikhara for the unknown future, not for the now. As for the now, investigate. Make your istikhara. And the ulama said there are some signs to the istikhara, but don't use them specifically. Don't rely on one or two. Don't say... I made an istikhara and that night you saw a dream. You saw snakes and dogs. Is he good for me? I say, no, that's the shaitan. The shaitan is telling you don't take him because it's probably good. So, but the istikhara, so this, there's nothing that says you have to see a dream after the istikhara. Dreams in general come in three forms, in general. Not attached to istikhara, just in general. Number one, they are the conversations you have with your conscience. The things you think about in the day, when you go to sleep, your brain and you talk to each other. That's the majority of dreams, the majority of us. The second type of dream are nightmares that come from the shaitan. They're the, the dogs and the cats and the scary monsters and the snakes and I don't know what, and the night terrors and the um, per sleep paralysis, all these come from the shaitan. They don't harm you, they just scare you a little bit, you wake up, you're a little bit terrified, recite Ayat al-Kursi. Turn to the other side and say, Bismillah, and you'll be okay, inshallah. The third type of dreams are the ones from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're difficult to see properly. Sometimes they're mixed with other things. So you've got to ask the, 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 a shaykh or an imam or a scholar or somebody you know who's knowledgeable a little bit who can kind of give you some advice. You don't just go and determine it yourself. That's not attached to the istikhara. It could be, but it's not. Nor is it that you're going to say, oh, I feel so good. Habibi, when the sun comes out, I feel good. Some people, they, they're not thinking about, I've seen this before, they're not thinking about someone, but it was a nice day. They go, and they fall in love. It's not because the girl or the boy is good, it's because the sun was out. It's because the weather was nice. You had euphoria. The hormones came out, the happy for, the serotonin and dopamine, right? It, you you got to distinguish between psychological or hormonal um, reactions, a bit of adrenaline, and use your brain. Just sit down, write it down. What questions? What's important in my marriage? What's important in my life? Let's look at my family. What kind of a family would suit that I'd be part of? Imagine myself in 10 years' time and I have children. How would my life be? Then go and talk. Do I work? What would I like her to be? How would I like him to be? What would matter to me? What would make me stop getting into this marriage? That's how you think, logically and rationally. Then the istikhara comes later for the future. So that Allah can be there for you and open the pathway for you. Sometimes you may see ease, doors opening, opening, opening. That's a good sign. Sometimes you won't feel anything at all. Sometimes you won't feel anything at all. I tell you, keep going. Sometimes you may feel a little bit up and down. Maybe, maybe not. It doesn't matter. Keep going. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, alhamdulillah, you'll know in the end. You will feel it in the end. Just by the way cause and effect is. That, man, this is getting too hard. Father's getting really stubborn. The girl is having thoughts up and down. One minute we're together, next minute we're not. Uh, I've seen so many red flags. So try to understand what your feelings are and what your brain is telling you. 
It's very, very important. So, brothers and sisters, with the advice and support of family and elderly, inshallah, and by praying to Allah and making dua, you cannot go wrong. Brothers and sisters, and your investigation and research. Brothers and sisters, therefore, now we understand what the istikhara is. Okay? It's for the future. For now, make your research. Investigate. Do all the things you have to do. And make a decision. There's nothing perfect. You're never going to have a perfect wife or husband, ever. And you're still going to have your ups and downs. Don't blame it on istikhara, no. But Allah will be there for you in thick and thin. You just do what's right by what He told you, and the rest of it, rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and keep going. All right, brothers and sisters? That's the best thing, inshallah. Uh, now we move to the third part. Let me just, I wrote it over here. The third part, brothers and sisters, imagine now that you have decided that you want to marry this person or that you want to go ahead. Brothers and sisters, there are conditions in Islam for a valid marriage. All of you need to understand this. And there are about three steps to it. Three simple steps. The first step is proposing. A simple proposal. It doesn't mean she's yours. It doesn't mean he's yours. No. Uh, it depends on your culture. In my Lebanese culture, they call it Aril Fetha. Actually, they have four different stages, my God. The first one is Haki, which means talk. It means go over and say, mm, we're kind of interested. Let's see. And she comes out and gives some coffee to you. And that's when you're supposed to look at her for the first time. And she comes in and you look up at her and then you look down and she looks away and she acts all shy, you act all shy. All of that stuff. The father's staring at you and you're sweating. You don't know what to do. They call me up, poor things. Wallahi, these brothers, I feel sorry for them. They say, who should I take? My dad. I said, take your dad. He talks, you shut up. Don't say a single word. <laughs> Let him talk. If you're asked, answer. If you're not asked, don't say a word. <laughs> Just get to know. And people are different personalities. Just by doing that, you learn a lot by being quiet and observing. You know, B Before emptying here, the words, fill here first. Fill the brain and then you can talk, inshallah. So first time it's going to be like that. We have this in our culture. If that is your culture, go ahead. And a brother once, I get asked by these brothers, say, I've, I've, I've kind of interested in this girl, but she, she's not from the same nationality or the same background that I come from. What should I do? I go, go and find out, ask people, learn about their culture, go and visit them, give them a call, um, learn their culture, ask people who know about their culture and see what is the right way to do it. So the right way in Islam to approach a proposal is to respect the culture of the person you're going to. And mostly men are the ones who do the proposing, mostly. Although a woman can propose to a man, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But mostly men do it, even just naturally. Naturally, a man does the proposing, and the woman then thinks, and th you know, she, she acts all cute, and she might feel a little bit spoiled. Should I take him or not? Maybe I can test him out a little bit. Yes, no, no, yes. You know, sometimes they like to play a bit of nice, healthy games, they call it. Brothers and sisters... So approach it through the culture. Now the second thing, we have it in our Lebanese culture, you've got to do Aril Fatiha. Now this is not part of Islam, I don't do it, but they do it anyway. It means reciting Al Fatiha. And the meaning of that is, okay, we are now up to the second stage. Uh, do the Fatiha so that we can, he'll come and, and go and, and, and visit a lot. So he'll come whenever he likes. Son, you can come and visit, but you can't come visit without the father or brother or someone there. So usually the boy goes and visits, and then the parents say, say, well, we want to visit you too first, so they come and visit. And then you go and come, you talk on the phone and stuff like that. For a little while, uh, my advice is not to take too long. And then the engagement period. This is now where we reach the second stage of Islam. So the first one is to go and, and say we would like to you know, ask if we can get to know the daughter for my son, or he might go himself. I know a brother who went and knocked on the door and says... I'm your neighbor from that block over there. He says, what do you want? He says, um, and then he didn't know what to say, so he returned. Comes up to me, he goes, Sheikh, what am I going to do? I said, all right, it's time to take someone with you. So have you got a dad? He goes, of course. He's not in my life. I go, take your uncle. Not in my life, poor guy. I go, I'll go with you. So I went with him. And alhamdulillah, uh, before going there, I did call him and convince the father to just at least try him out. You know, just get to know the guy. Sometimes you need a bit of help. So, boys, brothers and sisters, it's not just one, one rule or one law fits all. You've got to be a bit creative. So we went there, alhamdulillah, and uh, 
It didn't work out in the end, but at least it was friendly and respectful and there, were no bit, there was no bitterness left in, in the end. But you get engaged is the second stage. What is engagement? In Islam, it's called al-khitbah or al-khutubah. Al-khitbah uh, is... So when we go and give the khutbah on Jum'ah, it's called khutbah. So don't mix in khutbah and khitbah. Khitbah is the correct name for getting engaged in Islam. What does it mean? It means that the father of the girl and you, or your father, whoever you want, you come to an agreement, you shake hands on the agreement that now my son and daughter and your daughter are getting to know each other officially. Getting to know each other officially. You have the permission of the fathers, the parents know, they can call each other, they can talk, they can visit, but only with a chaperone. They have to have someone around them. They can meet in a public place, usually a Muslim place. Uh, you can meet at the mosque, you can meet at the house, at events. You can have, some people said to me, what if the father and brother are not there? I say, that's okay. If the mother's there and, you know, it's not, and, and it's safe and everybody respects each other, inshallah, just stay there and, and, and meet the girl and get to know her. There are no strings attached during engagement, which means you cannot hold hands, you cannot kiss, you cannot hug, you cannot be alone together in a room. Any one of you in the time of the engagement of getting to know each other can pick up the phone and say, I'm not interested. And that's it. And you just walk away. Nobody can pressure you. There is nothing. There are no conditions. And any gifts that you gift each other during the engagement, it's a gift. You can't say, I want it back. The Prophet ﷺ said, giving a gift and taking it back is like vomiting and eating a vomit again. You've given it. It's your fault. You went and gave it. You, or maybe you're nice. You're just too generous. MashaAllah. May Allah reward you. Don't ask for it. Don't lower yourself, okay? You give a gift, alhamdulillah. You were generous, you had a good time, you got to know him, you had the opportunity, but it didn't work out. If the other person wants to give back the gift, that's fine. But here is a, a little advice. Don't go overboard with gifts, brothers and sisters, during the engagement time. All right? Don't. And that's a time for you to really learn about each other. Are they materialistic? Are you? So just be very... Very easy. You can get some chocolates if you like. You can get some, some fathers don't even like it. I remember one brother I went to talk to, and a father said to me after the brother left, I was helping him out. He said, Why don't you even bring chocolate? I don't like him to bring chocolates. What is this, a romance? He's not even attached to my daughter yet. And he started getting angry. I said, Calm down, man. He's a nice man. He's just bringing chocolates. What's the big deal? Take it easy. I had to calm the guy down. Some people, they've got different personalities. His parents, just take it easy, you know, take a chill pill if. It's okay. Things are going fine. Alhamdulillah. I always say this statement. Make the halal easy so that the haram does not become the alternative. If you make the halal hard, the haram becomes easy. Make the halal easy, the haram becomes hard. Make the halal hard, the haram becomes easy. All right, brothers and sisters, make the halal easy, inshallah. Now, the engagement period is just that. Getting to know each other. All it means is that if anybody else calls the parents to say or wants to propose to the girl, they say, no, no, she's at the moment engaged. And it is haram in Islam to get engaged to a sister when you know a brother of yours, uh, someone has already, is already in the process of getting to know her. So this is the real meaning of going out in the Western meaning. You're not going out together, you're getting to know each other. Sometimes at school... You get these little kids who've just hatched out of the egg, man. They know nothing about life, and they think they can get married just tomorrow like that. They're in year seven or year eight or year nine, and then, oh, they're going out. I say, what do you mean you're going out? They go, it means that at lunchtime they walk together around the block, and whenever she's at the canteen, he's at the canteen. They're going out. But this is not going out. So stop it. Stop this. Stop it. Stop. Move away. <laughs> so this is serious, okay? Brothers and sisters... Engagement period is getting to know each other. There's no strings attached. Anyone can just walk away with no conditions. Does everybody understand that part? Okay, alhamdulillah. Now we reach the third stage, which is called the contract of nikah, the contract of marriage. In Islam, yes, there is love and there's interest and there's all of that. But at the end of the day, it is a contract. You are entering into a mutual agreement that is the most serious agreement on earth. Allah calls it in the Qur'an, مِيثَاقًا غَلِيظًا A very serious contract. It is a contract. 
It is a contract because you are giving something, they're giving something, you're exchanging something. There are, it's human lives that you're dealing with here. So it is a contract. There are rights, responsibilities, agreements, everything. But it's not like a business contract. It's not like buying a house. There's love involved. There's mutuality. There's kindness. There's generosity. There's courtesy. So when people enter into a marriage contract, take it easy. Don't sit there talking about every nitty-gritty right. Take it easy. Give and take. Be easy. Remember we said make the halal easy so the haram becomes difficult. In Islam, there are five conditions for a valid marriage. Only five. Plus, listen carefully, plus one right that has to happen. What's the difference between condition and right? The condition means if one of them is missing, the marriage has to be done again. It's not valid. The right, which is the sixth thing, it's called a right, the marriage is still valid if it's not there, but it has to eventually happen. We'll talk about them, inshallah. The first five conditions to the marriage are, number one, the identity. The identity of the couple. So that when they come to get married in the marriage contract, and I'll explain how it's done, the names have to be said loud and the names have to be known. And if you're writing it, it's better to write it. The celebrant or the imam, whoever's doing the marriage, has to write the names and you have to say them. The way I do it, there's several ways you can do it. The way I do it, and as you know, I'm a marriage celebrant, maybe half of you. Did I marry? Hands up if I married people off, just for fun. Anyone here? Come on, man. If nobody puts their hand up, this is the first. Ooh, no one. Soon. Soon, inshallah. Not you, Hadran? Ah, oh, met his wife at one of my lectures. Ha ha, see, that's what I'm talking about. But, you know, I'd be walking in the, in the supermarket at Woolworths. It's happened to me many times, and a couple would walk up to me, shining, life, you know. And I, I said, okay, here it comes. I don't know what this is. Say, so, it's us. So who's you? It's us. I say, who? I'm sweating. I'm thinking. So someone, and they say their names. I go, yeah, who? So remember, you married us. When? Like, you know, six years ago. At, I can't remember. Six years ago. And I act like I, I know, and I get very embarrassed. By so I forgive me if you're among here or you're listening. I apologize. Sometimes you do, you know, a thousand marriages. It's hard to remember. Who's from who? So I apologize. I'll tell you this little story. Wallah. I'm sitting with this at a family occasion. This mother, a mother, who is elderly mother, was sitting with me. She says, so how's your mom? How's your dad? Alhamdulillah, they're very good. And we're talking right about Lebanon. We're talking stuff. And then her son's sitting there. He was my student back in the days. I said, inshallah, inshallah, when your, brother, your son gets married, I'm going to do it as a gift for him. For free. Gift. And then her jaw dropped. She says, are you serious? I said, yeah. She goes, no, no, yani, Anjad, really? I go, yeah. I won't, I won't take money. Like, She said, you did his marriage last week. <laughs> Wallahi, I did his marriage like, the week before and I had forgotten. I was so embarrassed. Wallahi. Subhanallah. So forgive me, it happens. Anyway, we move on. So the way I do the marriages is I sit the, 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 the groom and the father of the bride. Sometimes the groom chooses his father out of respect to represent him. We have two witnesses. We agree on something called the mahar. I'll explain it. And then I get the fathers to shake hands and they say the words. The words for a marriage, for it to count, is like this. The father of the groom or the groom himself has to say verbally for people to hear, I request your daughter so-and-so and you have to name her in marriage in accordance with the Qur'an and Sunnah and on the mahar that we have agreed upon. And then the father will reply, on behalf of my daughter, I give her so-and-so to you, so-and-so, or to your son, so-and-so, in marriage, in accordance with the Qur'an and Sunnah and on the mahar we've agreed, and they say we accept and agree. Sometimes I turn to the groom and I ask him, do you take so-and-so to be a lawfully wedded wife and to treat her with goodness, care, compassion and love? 
as much as Allah has, has uh, uh, within your capacity, he'll say, yes, I do. And sometimes I turn to the bride as well. I do like to do that. It's not necessary, but I do turn to the bride. Sometimes she's shy and I feel sorry for her. But I ask a quick question. Do you accept to marry him? Yes. And she says, yes, khalas. it's done. So that's very, that's it. Some people, my friend, he got married in Malaysia. Malaysia is a beautiful country, but they have this rule. When you get married, you have to say the statement, the specific words, You've got to say them without breathing. I think I'm right. You've got to say them all in one breath, and you've got three chances. If you make a mistake, third time, you've got to go back, come back another time. You can't get married to her that day. It happened to my friend. He's, he's from uh, Uganda, married uh, Chinese Malay who had, uh, alhamdulillah, reverted to Islam. And uh, he said, I said it the first time, I made a mistake. The second time, they said, you've got one more. <laughs> one more chance. And he goes, Alhamdulillah, I said it. It's very nerve-wracking. But in Islam, really, it's not necessary to do that. What if you can't talk? What if you're hearing impaired? You can sometimes just understanding, nodding, agreeing, pointing is fine. Yes, or I can ask you a question. So it's very simple, inshallah. So, brothers and sisters, you can see the identity is very important. You need to know who is getting married. You can't just say, my oldest daughter, my youngest daughter. My daughter who wears the glasses? No. You have to say the names. And the son. So that's the first condition. The identity. The second one is the consent of both the couple. The boy and the girl, the groom and the bride, both have to have given their approval and their consent. If the, girl, if the, the bride has been married before, she must pronounce her consent in front of the witnesses or the people. She has to say it. Or in front of the celebrant and two witnesses. As for the bride who's never been married before, she hasn't been married before, for her it's a bit easier. She can say yes, or her father can say it on her behalf. And if she is silent, it means she approves. If she doesn't approve, she has to say no. She must say no. I personally ask the father and I ask the daughter all the time. Sometimes, what I do, if she's not around, I say, I've got to go inside. I've got to get her to sign. I want to hear her statement. One time, I did a marriage, actually it was being a couple of times like this, where I noticed the girl wasn't there and the father of the girl was very agitated. And the groom came along with his uncle and the family. And I noticed something. I won't say because I don't want to expose who it is just in case. I noticed something that made me feel that something's wrong. So I said, everybody, we're going to have to stop. I asked the father a few questions. He told me some things that I said, well, this is not right. And I went to speak with the daughter. I said, is this true? She said, yes, but I want him. I said, okay, let's just think about this and that. Maybe this is, there's a trick here. And subhanAllah, she was convinced that after speaking to her, there was some trickery happening. It wasn't genuine. And then alhamdulillah, I called the marriage off. So sometimes it's hard on a sudden, you've got to investigate a little bit. So the consent is very, very important in a marriage. There is a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's in Sahih Muslim and similar to it in Bukhari. He said that a, uh, there was a, a, a sahabi, a companion, whose sister, no, no, uh, a, 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 a woman came to Aisha radiallahu anha. And she said, my father married me gave me away to this man without asking me my consent. He didn't ask me. Next minute I saw myself married in their culture. So she said, let's wait for Rasulullah to come and, and answer. When he came along, he asked her, is this true? And she described, it was, I, I had no, no say in the matter. And then once Rasulullah confirmed it, he said, you have the choice to stay with him or leave him. And marry anyone else you want. Because the marriage was not valid without her consent. So she said, I choose to stay. But I wanted people to know at least that we are not forced to marry without our consent as women. Because the culture there, the man chooses, the woman can't choose. That was the culture before pre-Islam, pre-Quran. Yani. So Rasul gave her even the option of just walking away from the marriage and choosing any man she wants. No divorce, nothing. Because it was without her consent. Another woman came to the Prophet ﷺ. The hadith is also authentic. And it's very well known. She said to him, Ya Rasulullah, they got me married to this man. 
I didn't really see him until the day of my wedding. And the first time I saw him, I found that he was extremely unattractive to me. When he walks with the men, he's the shortest and the bulkiest and the least attractive. He's got no money. He's not known. I don't know what I'm doing with him. I can't. I fear that I'm going to earn sins by staying with him. Sins meaning I can't give him his rights as a husband. So he called him and said, what's the mahar that you gave? He says, I gave her a land, a little strip of land as her bridal gift. And she said, return the land to him and you divorce her. And that's it. They, they got divorced. It's called khula. So people are not forced to stay in a marriage that has been, they were pressured to. Or if it gets to a point where the marriage becomes so toxic that you guys are going to earn sins by staying in the marriage. Where the rights are not going to be met, then there is a room for both the man and the woman to get out of the marriage. But obviously there is a process. Today is not the time to talk about that. We'll talk about it next week. So the consent of the couple is a condition of the marriage. Number three is the wali. A wali means the guardian. Who is the guardian in the marriage? Listen carefully, brothers and sisters. I have to make this very clear. The guardian of the bride. The groom does not need a guardian. He represents himself. The bride needs a wali. She needs a guardian who represents her and speaks on her behalf and has to approve. Why? Because the person who has to provide, protect, and look after in the marriage, in the first degree, is the husband. So when he comes in, he represents himself because he is the one who's saying it. But he can nominate his father if he likes or his uncle or whoever. Because he's the one that's entering into this contract and taking on that responsibility. Why do we have her father and not her herself? Because her father or her uncle or whoever it is who is her guardian, in Islam, it is the duty of the male members of a family, the male members of a family who are related to the girl, who are responsible to protect and provide for the girl. Not the mothers, not the aunties, not the sons. It's always either the father or the uncle or the grandfather or the son or the brother. Because they're responsible for that, they're responsible for her protection and her affairs, her father has to come and give that responsibility from him, transfer it to this new husband. So he shakes hands with him and says, I give you my daughter, meaning I now give you the responsibility. I'm no longer responsible for you are. And we need the father there because he has got that duty and he has to pronounce and declare that the duty has been passed on and he agrees that the, it's been passed on to him. So there's no clashes. So when you understand the duties of the men and women in a family uh, unit, you'll understand why we have the guardian there. And really it's about the protection of the girl and her interests. All these men come along and these women, out of the, mostly for the girl. So that she is not played around with, she is not used, she is, her rights are met. Because, you know, in those times, especially a girl who hasn't been married before, she, her feelings are really up in the air, and so is the boy, right? And so you need a chaperone, you need a guardian who comes in and says, okay, I'm going to think up here while you guys think here. So it's very important in Islam, you'll understand once you understand the family unit. So you need a wali. Now, brothers and sisters, the wali has, it's a ladder. There is an order to the wali. The first person who has to be the wali, the guardian, is her father in the first degree. The father is the main one. If the father is absent or he di he's dead, he died, for example, passed away, the next one after him is the grandfather, his father, from the father's side. He's the next one in responsible in Islam. If the grandfather's not around, it's if she was married before, it's her son. Her son is the one that represents her affairs and makes sure her rights are met. So basically, they make sure their rights are met. When you have a husband coming, a man coming to ask for the, for the daughter, and he has a man in front of him, the language changes, doesn't it? It's like, yes, I'll make it easy, but be careful. So then, if the son is not there, then we take the brother, the brother of the girl, who is from the father's side, or her brother who is from her mother and father. If the brother's not there, then the next closest relative from her father's side, so a nephew, a cousin, that's the correct order. Because in Islam, it is always the father's side of the men who are responsible to provide, protect, and uh, make sure the interests of the, fam of the girls of the family are met. 
That's why the Prophet Sallallahu is to say, خيركم خيركم The best among you men is the one best to the women of his family. Ahlihi meaning his wife, number one. And Ahlihi also means his mother, his sister, his daughters, the Ahl. Brothers and sisters, that's the Wali. Some questions have been asked. Is there a difference of schools of thought? Do all the scholars, all the schools of thought in Islam say you have to have the Wali in a marriage? That's a fair question and I'll answer it. There is a slight difference of opinion on whether the wali is really a condition of the marriage for it to be valid or not. The marriage is of two parts. The contract where you sign or you talk and then there's the part which is called the consummation. What's the difference? The first part is just verbally and on paper. But nothing, no contact between the husband and wife has happened. The last part is the consummation. Which means when they move in together, they consummate it. You know what I'm talking about, when the intimacy happened physically. All of the schools of thought, and there is no difference of opinion among the scholars that you need. Uh, actually, no, I, I made a mistake. Majority of the schools of thought, majority of them, say you cannot have a contract of marriage or the consummation of marriage without a wali. You must have the wali, wali's approval and consent. Or he delegates someone. The only school of thought that I know of who says, who differs with that opinion is the Hanafi school of thought. So the Malikis, the Shafi'is, the Hanbalis all say it must be a wali and unanimous classical scholars. The Hanafis have their evidence, and I don't have time to go through it today, but there is evidence from the Quran and Sunnah where they say and they justify in their own opinion that a girl doesn't really need her father's approval or the wali if on conditions she's old enough, she's mature enough, she understands and she's healthy, mentally fit, everything. Okay? That's only the Hanafi Mazhab. So if you go to a, a celebrant who follows that Hanafi Mazhab, he'll do it that way. But I don't do it that way. And the majority of celebrants, and to, so we don't have question marks on a marriage, always have the wali. I have never done a marriage without a wali, alhamdulillah. But another question arises. What if the wali is a bad man? What if he's not a Muslim? What if he drinks? What if he takes drugs? What if he's so unreasonable? Just says no to every guy. We say, then we change the wali from the father to the grandfather. The grandfather's the same, we go to the son. Son's the same, we go to the brother. We keep moving. But this is a bit tricky, brothers and sisters. You can't just go ahead and haphazardly. You need to go to an imam or a sheikh or go to other people in, in your family to discuss this. It says why dad doesn't want. Try to understand why dad has said no. So the only reasons that the father can use is religious reasons. Like he can say... The person's not a Muslim. The person's a drug addict. The person drinks alcohol. The person doesn't pray at all, right? The person is known to go to nightclubs and dance parties and flirts around with girls. I've investigated and he's a player. These are good reasons. Or the person has no finances, can't look after your daughter. You need to be looked after. He can't shelter you, can't clothe you, can't spend on you. He's, he's, he can't even spend on himself. Then these are valid reasons. So that the father has to make sure that he is looking after the best interests of his daughter. But unfortunately, some fathers, they're just so unreasonable. In fact, I get a lot of fathers like that. I have a lot of calls like this, boys and girls, especially the girls. They say, my father's just so unreasonable. Sometimes the parents are divorced, the father's out of the picture, and I'll talk about that as well. But sometimes the fathers, they try to be in the picture, and some fathers, they're just abusive. And they say no to every person that comes along based on. So these are some of the reasons that scholars have put, there's nothing specific in Islam which says this, this, this and that, but things that are unreasonable, such as uh, the color of his skin is racist. Uh, some fathers reject him because the father says, I just don't like him. Just like that. What, what, what don't you like about him? Is that he's got religion? Alhamdulillah, he's got good character. Yeah, it's all of the ideas. I've got, I got nothing to say, I just don't like him. It's haram to say no and make it hard like that. Or maybe there's something personal. There's a hadith, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's also authentic, where uh, a sahabi, his daughter, his sister got married. The hadith is in Bukhari. So Imam uh, uh, Ibn Hajar comments about this. He says his sister got married and then the guy, his brother-in-law divorced her. Divorced the sister of this companion. After the idda was over, so there's something called the idda, the guy came back to remarry her and she agreed 
She says, yeah, okay, we'll reconcile, get back together. Maybe they had children together. Maybe they just loved each other. Her brother, in the absence of the father, was her wali. He said, over my dead body, I go and help you get married to her. I look after you. I paid for your wedding. I paid for your this and for that. And now you come to ask for my day. Ah, sister, it's not that easy, mate. Get out of here. This is a personal endeavor. Vendetta, sorry. They went to the Prophet wasallam, and that's when the verse of the Qur'an was revealed. What is the verse? The verse of the Qur'an says, and I want the fathers to hear this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, وَإِذَا طَلَّقْتُمُ النِّسَاءَ فَبَلَغْنَ أَجَلَهُنَّ فَلَا تَعْضُلُوهُنَّ أَنْ يُنْكِحْنَ أَزْوَاجَهُنَّ إِذَا تَرَاضَوْ بَيْنَهُمْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 232, When you divorce women and they have completed their waiting term, do not hinder them from marrying other men if they have agreed to this in a fair, that is, in a fair manner. That is an admonition to everyone of you who believes in Allah and the last day. That is a cleaner and purer way for you all. Meaning, don't restrict your daughters, your sisters, and anyone who you are um, given by Allah the uh, responsibility of the duty of care, do not restrict their opportunities and their chances if the man is reasonably a good Muslim and reasonably of good character, honest and can look after her. You should not refuse that type of a man. So Allah said, don't restrict them because what happens afterwards? We make the halal hard. What happens? The haram becomes... Easy. We've seen this happen a lot in our community, have we not? We have many. I've seen it happen many times. And what they do is they start to hide it from their parents because the parents are unreasonable. Two years later, they've been in a relationship. Finally, the parents know and they're attached and the parents over my dead body. The father makes a big deal. So, yeah, make it easy. The reason why they did this sometimes is because you're a difficult person. Then you have the other way around where some kids, they just... They don't care about the parents. No. Talk to your parents. Keep them in the picture. You're going to have them there anyway. They can guide you better. For people who have good relationships with their parents, ask them. Talk to them. They'll guide you, inshallah. Don't go and get attached outside in the wrong way and then get heartbroken and not eat and get mental illnesses as a result. Do it the right way, inshallah. Keep it halal. I've had a lot of youngsters who say to me, is it halal for me to like someone? I said, you can like him it's not in your control, you like him. But don't do anything haram. Don't go further. Don't sit there talking and flirting with them and talking like, wait until you're ready and then you can go and ask for a hand. Insha'Allah. There's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes you have the parents who are divorced and the father may have some court orders against him, IVOs and I don't know what and he's been trying and trying and trying but sometimes there are mothers who are just nasty. They keep the father away from the children for their personal vendetta. Some fathers are like that also towards the mother. I'm not saying just one side. But it happens a lot. And I hear it a lot. And I get frustrated a lot. And what can you do, subhanAllah? Fathers are absent by force. I say, I need the father. No, over my dead body. The father can't be there. Some of them have legitimate excuses. Sometimes they don't. Many times I've called the, the absent, so-called absent father. And he cries on the phone. Many times I've had fathers they cry to me. Wallahi, akhi, I tried my best, they say. I tried my daughter. I miss them. I'm, I, I haven't eaten. I'm destroyed. But their mother wouldn't let me. And this didn't let me. And they put this on me. And they put false accusations against me. Haram, haram. Sometimes the other way around. Some mothers get mistreated like that. And they're abused as well. Both parents remember the children. Subhanallah. And then they're stuck. I remember sometimes uh, daughters, they get brainwashed. I don't want the father whatsoever. I don't even want to be called by his name. I don't want him present. I say, haram. It's happened to me many times. Sometimes I say, I don't even want his surname. This is a major sin. To deny your lineage means that you were born on the street from some, the, what, the milkman? Who? Who? Who's your father? This is an insult to you and to your mother when you say, I don't want to be called by my father's name. That's a major sin in Islam. If you don't know who your father is, that's bad. We have to have the father there. Sometimes the father delegates something. No, we can't delegate anybody. I, I want so and so. Don't be stubborn. Insha'Allah, you know, family, you bring families together. Marriage is also a serious contract. So these are some advices, brothers and sisters. I don't mean anyone in particular, just in general, insha'Allah. And so the, the, the conditions are number one, identity of the couple. 
Number two, consent of the couple. Number three, the wali, the guardian of the girl. Number four, two Muslim witnesses who are known to be generally trustworthy, a good reputation. Number five, there is no legal impediment to the marriage. There's no legal or Islamic impediment, no reasons why you shouldn't get married. So, for example, in Islam, you discover that this person uh, is your half-brother or half-sister. You can't marry them. That's an impediment. You discover that they're still married to someone else. That's an impediment. You can't marry. And this, by the, way, by the way, the Islamic and the legal ones here in Australia kind of agree a lot with the legal impediments. There's, there's a lot of agreement there, some disagreements. But at the end of the day, no legal impediments. And I advise you all to go by the law because it's going to cause a tension and a problem in your marriage. You want a smooth marriage, inshallah ta'ala. So... Unless yeah, I mean, the law is going to make you do something oppressive, and that's not, inshallah, that doesn't exist. But uh, at the end of the day, make sure that you can have a smooth marriage, inshallah ta'ala. So these are the five conditions. And the sixth thing is the right. It's called the right of mahr, the bridal gift. We call it mahr, or uh, in English they say dowry or dawa. It's not the correct translation, but we'll explain it soon. Let's move to the two witnesses. The two witnesses, only in the Maliki school of thought, you don't have to have two witnesses at the time of the contract, but you must have the witnesses at the time of consummation. Some people, they do the contract and they say, we'll have our wedding and moving together six months later. We have this in our Islamic culture. Because in our Islam, we don't have boyfriend and girlfriend relationships. You don't go out together and meet together and then you get married years later. We don't have that. That's the shaitan's way. We don't... I'm so tempted to say it. Can I say it? You don't try before you buy. Anyway, that's, you, don't, you don't do that. Sorry, I, I have to say it. We don't go out and do the haram, and then we think, should we get married? You've been living like married couples anyway. Well, I, I do marriages sometimes for people who've been together for a long time. They've got children. Then they want to get married and make it halal. It's a big problem, brothers and sisters. Do it the right way, inshallah, and save yourselves the headache and the heartache. Anyway... You have to have two witnesses, generally. The two witnesses have to be Muslim, trustworthy, should they be men or women? Well, the unanimous agreement of all the scholars and the classical scholars, that should be women. But I'm going to... Ex uh, men, sorry, they have to be men. There is, however, in one of the opinions of the Hanbali school, and the... I think it's the Maliki school, I think, one of them, don't hold me to account... They say that if you have to have one man and two women, they say that's at least less problematic. Why? Why, can't, why don't you have women? Well, it's got to do with society and communities. Throughout society, throughout this 1,400, throughout our cultures, most of the time it is the men who are involved in the contract of the marriage. Women are not normally involved. So they say if you have the women, it's going to be a problem. Right for us, it's going to be ambiguous. People are going to ask, "What do you mean?" But women don't usually attend here in Australia and in the West. We have a lot of women; they do attend. So, to save us from that problem, we say, "Look, just have two men, just so that nobody says anything, and so long as the men are available." Alhamdulillah. And even if you don't have the two witnesses and nobody wants to be a witness, then you have to do it publicly in front of the audience. The audience can be witness as well. If there are audience, Muslim audience, they can be witness, and it's not a problem. Now we come down to the last thing, which is called the mahar. The mahar, my dear brothers and sisters, is something you have to give to the wife that she requests. You don't give it to the father. You don't give it to the brother. You don't give it to anyone. She requests it, and if it's, you are able to fulfill it. Mahar means, loosely said, a bridal gift, but it's compulsory by God, so it's not literally a gift. It's a compulsory giving that you agree. You can agree with her father. She can talk but she has to agree with it and she's happy with it it can be a ring it can be jewelry it can be a gold nugget it can be a land a car a house it can be money it can be anything it can be a hajj a service doesn't matter so long as it's within your means and the easier it is the better some people write for example a, a diamond ring to the value of four thousand five thousand dollars and jewelry to the value of, say, $7,000. Some of them do that. Some of them, they say, $10,000 uh, put towards the furniture, $5,000 towards jewelry, and $20,000 you give it later when you have it. Some people, they write Hajj trip. 
a Hajj trip. So if they don't go to Hajj, however, let's say, God forbid, they got divorced or a death happened, we say you pay, you pay her, you give her the equivalent of what Hajj is equal to. Some of them, they agree to other things. Whatever they agree to, it doesn't really matter. Whether it's a lot or a little bit. If you agree to it, it's a debt. And Allah says, give the women their sadaq. Sadaq means the honesty, the token of honesty that you promised with good heartedness. Don't even show that you are hesitant after you have agreed to it. If you haven't agreed to it, yeah, you have the right to negotiate. But it's not a business transaction. You are not buying her. It's not a price. If it was a price, we would have said this much. It's not a price. It's what she wants. Why do you do it? Why do we have this? Well, again, you've got to know the roles. The role of the husband is what? To provide and to protect, to look after the best interests and affairs of his family in the first degrees. He's the leader of that. He will be responsible for his wife and children. Part of providing could be money. So in the time of the marriage, okay, it's a form of honesty. If you really are true to your word that you will provide my daughter and, you will prov and she says you provide for me, then she requests this. You give it. If you can. So it's a token of honesty. Number two, it's a proof that you can provide. Number three, it is a gift to make her feel that she's special. This is other than the wedding ring. This is called the mahr. And number four, it is to show the seriousness of the contract. Now there's a psychology to men and women. We're a bit different in our psychology. I'll give you an example. Have you ever been to an all-you-can-eat place? No? No, you haven't. Here in Australia, we have all you can eat. Eh, hands up, you've been to all you can eat. Come on, give yourselves up. Who goes to all you can eat? Uh, I can see you do. <laughs> Habibi, it's, that's good. It costs a lot of money to have that, mashallah. Brother, the belly is beautiful, son. It's very attractive to some women. Ala kulli hal. Brothers and sisters, you go to an all you can eat. Your wife, your wife goes to get her food from all you can eat. There's a hundred different foods there. What do they do? The wife and her sisters and the daughters. And then the husband comes along. This is what I've seen. The wife goes, I think that green color there is nice. I like that yellow thing. It looks nice. And they take one little piece and put it on their plate. Then they get another little piece. And, they, and it's like, it's just fun for them. It's like colorful food. The husband comes up and says, my God, I've paid $500 for this. I've got to eat the worth of $500. He goes and gets all the food, whether he likes it or doesn't. He gets the spaghetti, the rice, the chicken, the fried stuff. The stuff's going to give him a heart attack. I don't care. I've got to eat $500 worth. Isn't that right? So for the money, psychologically, his pocket is very important. For the wife, it's more about, you know, cosmetics and... Uh, enjoyment and happiness so long as we're together it doesn't matter about money this is in generally speaking in general the husband his pocket is very very precious and the wife she also finds her husband's pocket precious inshallah but Allah knows give from that which you find so precious give from your wealth to this woman that you're going to marry show that you will you are prepared and that materialism is, is nothing to you inshallah you're not afraid to spend on your family. So, having said this, brothers and sisters, there is a psychological difference and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it compulsory. If the mahar has not been agreed upon before the contract of marriage, it's okay. The contract of marriage is still valid, but it's owed. You have to agree on it. If you don't agree during your whole married life, let's say you got married and there was no mahar, and the, the husband died and never gave her the right, then if she wants it, we ask her. She might say, I don't want any mahar then that's okay. Allah says in the Qur'an, if you have agreed on a mahar and she forgives it all out of her own goodwill without being pressured or asked, Allah says then there's no harm upon you, O oh men, keep the mahar. But if she wants it, you must give it to the last cent, to the last gold nugget, everything, to the last coin. So if he dies and there was no mahar agreed upon, then she is given a mahar equal to the women who are like her in her own caliber and finances and family lifestyle. Or she might say it's okay. Or she can name it or she can say I forgive. Does that make sense? Subhanallah. And if they divorce and he hasn't written a mahar, then Allah says in the Quran, you must be generous without her asking, give her lots, help her, uh, be generous to her, like give her gifts. Just out of you know, it happened, the divorce, there's heartbroken, be generous to her. She's still your sister in Islam. One brother, he said, 
uh, to his friend, I'm getting divorced. He said, why? What did your wife do? He goes, she's my wife. No, no man with loyalty and honor talks about his wife. She's still my wife, man. We're going to get divorced. So anyway, the guy got divorced. His friend comes up. He goes, now that you're divorced, what did she do? He's a bit of a nosy bugger. So he comes up and says, she's still in her idda. In Islam, there's three menstrual cycles that the wife has to go through, hoping, in the hope that maybe they'll reconcile. That's why Allah put that idda. He goes, she's in her idda, man. She's still my wife. We're just, you know, separated. I won't talk about my wife. Then the idda went over and she was completely divorced, gone. He said, now she's no longer your wife. What would she do? He says, Habibi, before she was my wife. Now she's my sister in Islam and she's someone else's daughter. A Muslim doesn't talk about other people's daughters. <laughs> so he never got anything out of him. And that's, inshallah, that we can learn from this, brothers and sisters. Don't talk about, even if you got divorced, whatever happened. At the end of the day, well, brothers and sisters, things go wrong sometimes. Unless you have to. Unless you need to, to protect yourself or to defend yourself. Especially if law's involved. And you have to. Just say what's necessary. But don't go on a vendetta fighting each other. And brothers and sisters, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this long lesson tonight, I'm sorry I took long, has benefited you. This is crucial information I've always wanted to say. And there's so much more to say. My cameraman, may Allah reward him. He needs to go. So my cameraman, where have you gone? He's left his camera and gone. Habibi, Hadrami, he's not here. Anyway, if you have any questions, brothers and sisters, I'll stay for another 15 minutes, inshallah. And then everybody go to your wives and husbands and children. So, sallallahu ala nabina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. You know when I joke in class, 